Lord be with you. Good morning, friends. My name is Joshua Holando, and I'm the youth director here at City Church San Francisco. Um, Frederick Douglass once wrote that, um, 20 years I prayed and received no answer until I prayed on my knees. And as we start our service today, uh, that's what we want to do. We want to take time to pause and to pray, and maybe even pray on our knees. Uh, We want to make space uh, for reflection, Um, reflecting on this feeling of exhaustion that many of us may be feeling um, as we're reeling in from the tragic events uh, of this past week. I know that many of us uh, are devastated by the tragic events at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas and that our hearts are grieving uh, this morning. So as we're arriving, many of us likely feel bewildered at how to be in this moment, angry, tired that this is happening, that this continues to happen. I know that as a community, we're tired. Uh, We're tired of seeing how this violence devastates whole families, entire communities who are left to pick up the pieces. We're tired. Tired of seeing this, our idolatry for gun violence, take the lives of their most vulnerable people, our children, our younger people. We're tired of political leaders and spiritual leaders who offer thoughts and prayers, but do nothing, do nothing to enact just laws that prevent this from happening. So however you're showing up this morning, I would just invite you, invite us to lean into uh, this moment, to lean into our grief, Together over the next few moments, we're going to lean into that together and we're going to resist our tendency uh, to be numb and to just accept this as normal. Uh, We're going to resist distraction and society's attempts to pull us away from our bodies, from our rage, from our grief in this moment. And so together we're going to pray a brief prayer. I'm going to invite us collectively to take a few breaths and uh, we're going to breathe in our grief and breathe out our rage um, as a prayerful form of resistance. I'm going to use adapted works from Cole Arthur Riley, the creator of Black Liturgies, also uh, Maria Kane of St. Paul's Waldorf, and the African-American activist Andre Henry. And we're going to be using uh, their collected works uh, to hold space um, and and honor and grieve uh, the names of um, the victims of the Uvalde school shooting this morning. And so if you need time to step away, please do. We invite you to bring your whole selves into this moment. Um, And that means knowing yourselves. So um, if that's what you need to do, please feel free. Um, But we're going to pause for a moment. I'm going to pause, and then we're going to pray and breathe together. Let's pray. Join with, join with me in prayer now, beginning with Weeping with Uvalde by Reverend Maria King. God of our weary years, death has gutted us and left us reeling once again. Mass violence has thrust the people of Uvalde into an unrelenting abyss of grief. Instead of planning last day of school parties, parents and loved ones must now plan funerals. It shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. It just shouldn't be this way. Like the activist Andre Henry says, it doesn't have to be this way, but it is. Our words fail us 
Our tears drench us. Our rage consumes us. Our weariness overwhelms us. May our sorrow become fuel for compassion. Our cynicism, a catalyst for honest reflection. And our rage, a drive for holy action. The tools of violence may give ways to pathways of peace. O oh God, long after the cameras have moved on, may your fierce love and tenderness steady the feeble knees and shattered hearts of those whose lives have been changed forever. In the name of Jesus, whose love for children knew no bounds and whose heart now weeps in agony, we cry out. And then we work to repair the breach. Amen. We will now breathe together, and as we breathe, I will offer language to guide our breathing and hold space for those who have died. So breathing in. God, how long? Breathing out. My rage is my prayer. Breathing in. I make space for grief. Breathing out, my soul slows, I listen. Breathing in, God, how long? Breathing out, our rage is our prayer. Breathing in, we make space for grief. And breathing out, our soul slow, we listen. Amen and amen. So may our church become a resurrection hope through our lives and actions. May we resist despair and claim our hope in the risen one that death does not have the final word. And so with that in mind, please stand as we uh, continue in the season of Eastertide and resurrection in today's call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. God has ascended amidst shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to the Sovereign One. Sing praises. For God is the Sovereign of all the earth. Sing to God a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on the holy throne. Almighty loving God, we know that all things are in your hands. We know the power and authority belong to you and that you rule the cosmos with righteousness and with peace. But in this moment, we need to feel that you are near. So Spirit, would you speak to us this morning? May we feel you near to us, walking with us. In the name of the risen one, we pray. Amen.
the joy to be, joy to know it's when I decrease, to fill up my soul, what a joy to see, a joy to hold it when you increase, I want nothing more.
friends are called. The confession is from Isaiah 57, 15, which says, For thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with those who are contrite and humble in spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. If you were able to catch that, um, I love Isaiah's depiction of God's nearness. I think we see that most clearly and most vividly in the person of Jesus. In Jesus, the Palestinian Jew, we see a God who draws near to us, who doesn't hold our suffering at arm's length, but actually draws near and experiences suffering and pain and heartache and loss, just like we do. And so I know that in this moment, God's nearness and God's proximity to us might be very difficult to believe. Um, I think that in this moment, this is that invitation uh, to us as we enter into this time of renewal, the invitation to remember Christ, remember the God who is with us, the God who walks with us. And that's given to us if we just ask, if we just ask in faith, God be near. And so that's my invitation uh, to us this morning. It's uh, our invitation. Um, so let's pray uh, the prayer of confession uh, together. Holy One, together we confess that we sing of your love and proclaim your reign over all creation. We too often act as though you are distant and powerless. Remind us of your loving kindness and help us to live with confidence in your presence today and in hope for life with you forever. Amen. Take a moment now for silent confession. Now hear these words of encouragement from Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In Christ, we are loved and forgiven. Thanks be to God. Having received the peace of God, I would invite you in just a moment to turn your neighbor next to you and greet them with the sign of Christ's peace. Uh, you can say things like, the peace of Christ be with you or peace, with, peace be with you. But first, from me to you, the peace of Christ be with you all. Please stand and greet each other as a sign of Christ's peace. Peace be with you, 
Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. The peace I need. The world can take away. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Friends, we now move into the time of our service where we bless our children and our youth. Uh, children's Three years through third, third grade, we'll be proceeding to the gym. Pastor Jay's got a sign right there in the back. Uh, we got a fourth and fifth graders who will be joining their teachers in classroom one. And nursery care is open to our younger kids. Um, so uh, kids, where are you at? A little shout out? Okay, I see kids here. I see some of my students here as well. We got our youth here. Uh, this this uh, blessing is for our children and our youth. Um, you, were, you were such important members of our community. You teach us not to take ourselves too seriously, because we often do that. And you teach us so much about faith and enrich the faith of our church. And so our deepest prayer for you is that you would know how deeply loved uh, you are by God. That's, that's our deepest prayer. So First John says, See what love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, because that is what we are. So now let's bless our children and our youth together. People of God, what is our prayer for these children and youth? May the Lord be with you. And children and youth respond. Yeah, I heard that. That was great. May God's love sustain you. May God's spirit empower you. And may God's joy fill your hearts. And we all say, thanks be to God. Kids, you're dismissed. Everyone else can remain standing.
pray. Gracious God, we, we sing these things that, um, that your love is so great that we're not overcome, but the reality is uh, we all feel underwater. Uh, we all feel a little overwhelmed, maybe perhaps a lot. Um, we are grieving. We are in need of your presence in our life, and we need to hear each other sing these words together so that we will not be overcome so that your truth, your mercy, your goodness, your beauty will invade this earth through the witness of your church, through the witness of this church. Give us grace for that to happen as we seek to plant in this season of Easter resurrection flags in a world of Good Fridays. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We welcome you here again today. My name is Fred Harrell. I'm glad you've decided to be with us today. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, city Church exists to, following, to follow Christ, to see this city renewed. Um, city Church exists to become more and more, as we aspire to be, an inclusive community of Jesus followers seeking the renewal of San Francisco. And that's what we invite you into in this church, to be a part of that. We value um, being rooted in Christian faith. We value curiosity and listening to the ongoing guidance of the Holy Spirit and we value belonging because we know that when people know they are truly welcome and belong, they flourish. And so that's the kind of community we're creating here and online each week as we gather in all sorts of different ways. And again, we see it as our privilege to walk alongside you wherever you may be. So each week we say these words, we welcome into this service all persons into our faith community regardless of gender, race, age, physical or mental capacity, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or socioeconomic or marital status. Everyone is welcome here, and we're glad you've decided to be with us this morning. A couple of, uh, group of events and things that are taking place here in the life of the church in the days to come, we want to make sure you're aware of. We're having these things this summer called home gatherings. They're just ways for us to connect. You know, I mean, with, with new surges coming on, a lot of us are just feeling pretty lonely. And, uh, and we want to create good, safe ways for us to content, connect with one another with one another. And so we're doing this in people's homes. And so the first of this is happening next week. It was going to be right after church, but as you know, we're having a member meeting. I don't know, something happened when I was away. I, I don't get it, but there's some meeting next week. Um, but that's going to be next week on June the 5th, a member meeting uh, to uh, talk a about a number of things. We'll do a little bit of a, an update on our finances. We'll talk a little bit about other things that are going on in the life of the church, but to also do a little more deep dive and let you ask as many questions as you want of our search team um, who will be, uh, who, who announced last week 
uh, that we have uh, found our new senior pastor, Emily McGinley. So that'll be next week. But the member gathering, uh, the home gathering is going to be at 530 um, at the home of Thomas and Sophie Lee in the Portola. I say that right, Thomas? Yes? Okay, good. I got thumbs up. Um, so uh, don't say Portola. Just don't, don't ever say the Portola word. Portola, it will get stuck in your brain, then it'll just be Portola. But it's Portola. All right. Uh, that's happening. And that's going to go from 530 to 8 um, in their home. So register for that so that we can make sure there are a few uh, spaces left. And then another one's going to be happening on June the 16th at 6.30 p.m. in Pack Heights at the home of Sarah and John Dahl. These are really great uh, ways to connect with others, get to know people. We have so many new folks in our community right now. A great way for you to get to meet people so you don't feel alone here at church. Second thing we're going to be doing is board games. Board games are back, this time on Sunday, June 12, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, you can join City Church gamers of all ages for three, afternoon, for three afternoon hours of Hive, chess. I don't even know what Hive is, but great. Uh, chess, backgammon, monopoly, deal, bananagrams, and more. And there will be a puzzle table for introverts. I love that. <laughs> There's a room. I just read, I mean, I just got back on vacation. So I'm like, okay, that's a cool announcement. Who ever thought about putting it that way? That's probably Barbara. Um, there's rumor that Pastor Melissa might be leading a blackjack table. Hello. I hear she has like the little visor, right? You have a little visor, thing, the little things around your arm. Okay. And, uh, and so that's that. Okay, snacks, beverages, all of that, pizza. Uh, this summer, we're going to be hosting three faith and justice conversations, and we're going to do it following the Sunday service, the first of which is on June the 19th. Uh, the topic is Christianity and the problem of race. It's going to be led by Pastor Peter Choi, and the, we have a guest preacher for that day, Angie Hong. She's going to be a part of that as well. So we can plan for lunch, register for that important conversation. You can find a link on our events page or at faithjustice.net forward slash CCSF. All that uh, will be um, online. And uh, so that's all my announcements. We'll now hear today's scripture reading. chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. Then they had them brought before the magistrates and they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he had supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. 
Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before him, and he and his entire household rejoiced that they had become a believer in God. The word of the Lord. Take a moment now for silent reflection. Gracious God, we ask now that you would meet us here. Help us to believe that we're in this room because you have seen to it. Help us to believe that you see us right now. Whatever our social location, whatever our, our mental and emotional state, state, state of being is right now, however we walk in this room, help us to believe you see us. You see us in all of our complexity and all of our sorrow in all of our anxiety, in all of our joy, in all of our contradiction, and your response is always to move towards us in love. Help us to believe that you are actually already present within us and in us and in this room. And so help us to be present to your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a story we have here, right? I mean, a slave girl, a mob, a jailbreak, quite the, uh, quite the narrative. And I love preaching from these stories um, because if we will dig into them and if we'll pay attention deeply, um, we will find all sorts of ways in which this, these stories are just the story of our life today as well. In one of the commentaries I was looking at, a man named Matt Skinner said that this story is so familiar to so many if we will think about it. He says... The story features a culture that treats people like commodities, valuing them only insofar as they produce wealth. It describes a society that closes ranks against outsiders, concluding that foreign people and ideas are detrimental to established values and incompatible with true patriotism. It tells about a system that regards punishment and incarceration as easy solutions, preferring the blunt weapon of shame and retribution over the constructive tools of dialogue and rehabilitation. And then he says, I told you it was familiar. (laughs) I told you it was familiar. That's all contained in this story. And I think that it might be a good spot as we think about these stories, these little vignettes today that we're going to look at and then try to glean a few lessons from, that we remember that the Bible is relevant because it is a narrative told from the perspective of the poor, the oppressed, the enslaved, the the conquered, the occupied, and the defeated. That's part of the genius of Scripture, is that it's written not by the winners, by and large, but by those on the outside, those at the bottom. The subversive genius of the Hebrew prophets is this very, it's a bottom-up perspective. I mean, imagine a history of colonial America written by Cherokee native peoples and enslaved Africans. Now, that would be a different way of telling the story, and that's what the Bible does. It's the story of Egypt from the perspective of the enslaved. It's the story of of Rome from the perspective of those who are occupied militarily. It's the story of Babylon from the perspective of those who are exiled. On and on it goes. It just tells that story. Now, I'm not going to do a whole sermon on that today, but I just want to put that in there for you as you think about looking through these little stories in Acts 16. Because depending on your social location, you will actually hear, see, and understand things differently. And that's the importance that we have for listening to those outside of our own social location. And so let's look at this. The slave, the the slave girl, the mob, and the jailbreak. And then what lessons can we learn from each of those vignettes? in this passage today. The first is the slave girl. I mean, the first thing I ask this is, I wonder how she became a slave. How did that happen? I mean, did the certainty that she was possessed 
in some way? Uh, by, did her family just not know what to do with this person? You know, was, were you that person in your family system? They just weren't sure what to do with me and mine. I can tell you that. Probably not surprised to hear that. For those of you who know me, you were probably a, a lot, Fred. It may be like a lot of women. You know, this woman, she was told that she was a lot. I don't know how she became a slave. Maybe she was so, they were so poor, their financial separation or, or, or desperation so much that her family just allowed this to happen. Maybe her father pushed her out the door or the mother pushed her out the door. Or maybe she's an orphan. Maybe both parents had died and she had no other way of supporting herself except for this unthinkable way. We don't know. But in the midst of all of that, she spoke once and Luke records it in a way that would forever change your life. And it's, it looks like some kind of proclamation of the gospel. It says in verse 17 and 18, she says that the, woman, the, the slave girl would say, these men are slaves of the Most High God and who proclaim to you a way of salvation. And then it says she kept doing this for many days. We later learn that there's a demonic spirit is making use of her body just as her owners are making use of her. Which led one man to say this is the tortured speech of the enslaved masquerading as gospel words. And Paul was annoyed. And it suggests a level of frustration through repetition. Because it says in the text, she kept doing this for many days. So here's Paul annoyed. Good. Paul needs to be annoyed. Paul needs to be annoyed. He needs to hear what's happening here over and over again. She might say, this unnamed slave girl, we might say about her that nevertheless, she persisted. And I know that's a political catchphrase, but it's also the practice of almost every woman in the Bible. And every woman in the world, frankly, who demands equality and justice to be heard. So Paul's annoyed. Good, he needs to be. And Paul uses his power not to silence her, not to, not to push her to the side, but to release her from her captivity, networked as it was with a combination of spiritual and social captivity. Now, that's the slave girl. What are some lessons we can learn from that? Anyone like me, anyone like me who is a dominant caste person in the caste system that is our culture, I'm white, I'm male, moneyed, privileged, and we're reading these stories from the early church we should hear, A, definitely God's unconditional love in Jesus, no doubt. But B, we should be uncomfortable while hearing it. It is meant to discomfort those who are in the dominant position. This is what Scripture does over and over again, if we will listen. And anyone who is in the subordinate caste communities and minority and marginalized communities should hear about God's unconditional love in Jesus, yes, but be comforted that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is also the God of Sarah, the God of Hagar, the con concubine, of Rebecca and Rachel and forgotten Leah and Deborah the judge and Mary the brown-skinned unwed pregnant teen who gave birth to Jesus and in today's story the God of an unnamed slave girl. And if you are in those communities and you hear this, you can say, hallelujah, hallelujah. The God that we worship has not written me out of the story. I am definitely a part of God's story. No one is written out of the story. You're not written out of the story. No matter how many times you may have been told that you were a lot or different or perceived that you are, that you're not a part of God's story. You are. Now, my question is, who needs to hear that today? Who among you needs to hear today that you are a part of God's story? Who among you here today, who feels erased? Do you feel erased? Do you feel invisible? Do you feel like you're not seen? Maybe that's the one reason that by the work of the Holy Spirit, you are sitting in this room or joining us online right now just to hear, wait a second, God does see me in my particular moment that I'm enduring right now. I am seen. I am known. God has a part for you to play in God's plan for liberation. That's the lesson I glean from looking at the slave girl. Now, secondly, let's look at the mob. That's verses 17 to 24. 
we learn next in this work of liberation is never without cost. And all you have to do is follow the money. I mean, it's right there in the text. It says, when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone. So the motivation is in there. That's it. When they saw that she was no longer profitable, they seized Paul and Silas. You know, I don't know what the future holds for our country right now. I really don't. I've never felt more overwhelmed by it all. But there is going to be a cost if you are going to take your place in the work of liberation. There's going to be a cost. There always is. There was for Paul and Silas. The slave girl is a picture of a thousand enslavements where a lot of money is always to be made. Professor of New Testament theology, um, William Loder, says this, Tackle anything which is likely to lead to diminishing returns for investors, and you must be wrong from the very start. National leaders have used the same logic to resist doing sensible things about climate change. Of course, we'd add gun control as well. Don't threaten business. But while that seems obvious, what is said next by the owners is insidious. These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews. These men are disturbing the status quo, and oh, by the way, let's other them right now. They're Jews. One sentence, that sentence captures history, usually said by the owners, the privileged, the mob, the ones in control of economic and socioeconomic realities. The mob always engages in othering. Willie James Jennings, in his masterful commentary on the book of Acts, says, Owners are the high priests of the economic world. They announce and control what blesses and what transgresses economic life. Owners fear no religion, no faith, or its adherents. They only fear interruptions to the smooth flow of capital. These owners unleash an imperial power that is always at their disposal, one drenched in the seductions of money and influence. It's all here in this text. Greed, bigotry, a hostile appeal to cultural political identity that labels the other as different and therefore is dangerous and therefore has to be silenced, incarcerated. It would be irresponsible of me to not name similarly targeted groups among us, immigrant workers accused of taking our jobs, members of minority religious traditions who were seen as suspicious, if not sinister, those whose sexual orientation or gender identity doesn't fit the majority, and what might be a new record low, those, quote, illegals who might get baby formula before some of ours do. The othering is so deeply entrenched in our socio-political life right now, and people pay. And so what happens? Well, Paul and Silas are stripped, beaten, and incarcerated. The predictable result of mob violence, stoked by fearful, xenophobic declarations by people who are seeing an economic opportunity dry up, has come full circle. Now, let's, what are the lessons there? A couple of them. One, let's face it, folks. We have, a, we have a lot of folks, we have a lot of owners in this congregation. I'm one of them. I own a home, I own a car, I'm white, I'm male, I'm educated. I have all sorts, and I'm inviting you into this with me if you fit my category. I have all sorts of reasons and motivations to protect and ensure that anything that stops the flow of power and money to my advantage is continued. I have so much motivation for this that I can be sure that I'm not aware of how much my bias is driving my own ship of desires and needs and wants and demands. And so here's the intentionality that I must have, that I invite you into as well. 
if you're in my shoes and a Jesus follower. One is to interrogate the ways that I am complicit in oppression. And to, and to, and to do that work knowing that I, with my privilege, will literally just step on people and not know it's happening. So there has to be an intentionality around that. But secondly, we must be willing to open up our lives, use our power and privilege so that others might be liberated, to open our homes, our possessions, our privilege to use for the sake of the gospel to escape the seduction of power so that we can be a conduit of God's love in this city. Willie James Jennings again from his book, his, his uh, commentary on Acts. Ministry in the name of Jesus Christ releases people to speak, especially poor women, by challenging the voices of their own oppression that constantly wish to speak through them. The text does not give us the freed voice of the slave girl. Luke has, however, set us up to hear it freshly, newly, and without its chains. Churches should also long to hear freed voices and follow the Spirit in increasing their number. We so easily see the demons in the slave girl. Why? Why do we so easily see those demons in the slave girl and miss the ones that have made themselves all too cozy in our house of privilege? Well, Jesus wants to liberate us like these owners from a different kind of enslavement. So how is God calling you today? I'm asking. I'm asking you to ask yourself, how is God calling you to use whatever privilege and power you have to liberate, to bring about healing and wholeness and beauty in this world. And one more thing, one more lesson from this, this story about the mob and then being incarcerated. This story reminds us who gets arrested and who gets charged and who gets tried and convicted is very often a matter of who has access to resources and who enters judicial processes already profoundly disadvantaged. And that reality hasn't changed. And so for many of you, you've actually worked hard in bringing justice to that particular reality. Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration, The Age of Colorblindness, a book I just think you have to read if you haven't, says this. The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of nearly every developed country, even surpassing those in highly repressive regimes like Russia, China, and Iran. In Germany, 93 people are in prison for every 100,000 adults and children. In the United States, the rate is roughly eight times that, or 750 per 100,000. The racial dimension of mass incarceration is its most striking feature. No other country in the world imprisons so many of its racial or ethnic minorities. The United States imprisons a larger percentage of its black population than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. There's a book called Worse Than Slavery written by David Oshinsky, and he quotes a Mississippi government official right at the end of the Civil War. Emancipation will require a system of prison. And that's exactly what happened. So Paul and Silas in prison Paul and Silas in prison should remind us, Jesus' followers, who live on the other side of an incarcerated, brown-skinned, colonized Savior, that we know too much to ever be fooled into believing that prisons are neutral or natural or normal. We are to be people convinced by the love of God that no one is beyond change, looking at ourselves as an example, that execution or solitary confinement are responses that lack a moral imagination, not to mention are demonstrably impossible to actually enact with justice. And so it is no surprise to us that the writer of Hebrews 13, in, in chapter 13, would tell us to visit those in prison as though we ourselves were imprisoned with them. Which is why City Church has a long history and presence in county jail, and we will again once we are allowed back in. So that's what we learned from that. Now, lastly, this last story is about the jailbreak. Now, I grew up in church. Some of you may have, some of you may not. 
But when I grew up in church, we tended to focus on this part of the story. We didn't talk about any of the other stuff I've talked about, by the way. That never came up. But this part about singing hymns and praying together and being sprung from jail, we talked a lot about that one. And I don't know, I always, well, I, I, it's, it kind of was one of those things where, you know, you grew up in church, it's like, well, when things aren't going well, just pray and sing and then things will get better. And, you know, I'm all for that. And just some, it just seems like my timetable for when God needs to liberate is not the same as God's, right? But we do it. We gather here each week, almost as an act of resistance, to say, I will insist on hope in the midst of the tragedies around me. I will insist on it. So, pray, sing psalms, God will intervene. I'm glad Paul and Silas did that. I mean, I've never sat rotting in a first century jail, but I have prayed and sung in desperation. I've done it privately. I've done it sitting right there on that front row. That's where I normally am, right there. That's why I'm pointing over there. During a closing hymn, tears coming down my face as I'm concerned about a child or I'm concerned about this or that relationship or whatever. I've watched you do it too. We've prayed, we've sung in tears in the midst of desperate times. When we sing our hymns, we join those who went before us. Paul and Silas in prison, the early Christians in the upper room, the desert fathers and mothers escaping persecution, the medieval monks carrying tradition, and civil rights marchers trudging the path of faith and resistance, and all of us here today, praying and singing and listening to one another do so is something that we are called to do as we demand that we keep hope. And what I love is that it says the other prisoners were listening to them. The other prisoners were listening to them. And that's kind of where I put myself in this story right now. That's where I am. I'm looking at Paul and Silas in that jail. I'm listening to them sing songs. And I'm not sure I could sing along with them. Which makes this whole story such a primer on why we gather to worship in the first place. It's not just to sing our song, but to hear others singing it. Which is why it's so important that as soon as it's possible, we all gather back together. I love having an online presence. I'm grateful for it. It's not going anywhere. It's really important. But if you can be here, be here. Because we need to be together to sing songs and listen to each other singing because faith is given in sufficient quantities to a community of Jesus followers but it's rarely if ever given to just one Jesus follower at least that's been my experience but when I have it together when I have that together if you don't have faith enough faith this morning maybe there's enough collectively in this room to go around there's enough for us to rub it off on one another a little bit This is, this is enough because Jesus, the prayers of Jesus surround this community right now. In John 17, it says that he prayed not only for his disciples, but for all who would believe because of their testimony. That would be you. That would be me. That would be us. There's a certain sense that when we sing and pray together, we're just, we're just kind of entering in to what Jesus is already about as he intercedes for us even now. There's enough faith going around in that jail and enough love. There's enough love in that jail. Don't miss that part. The love in that jail. Where is it found? Paul and Silas stayed. So the, so the, the guard would not be executed. Did you miss that part? Did you see that part? Paul and Silas, oh, we're still here. We didn't leave. Had we left, you'd be up the creek. I'm not sure what that is in Greek, but there's, there's a phrase like that. Had we left, that'd be a problem. But we're here. It, it moved, the love that was in that prison moved that man to say, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas told him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And there's enough faith for your whole household. Everybody in. 
a theologian named Jürgen Moltmann who said this, great or small, man or woman, black or white, handicapped or non-handicapped, where God is known, the differences disappear and the democracy of the Holy Spirit begins. That is how new hope happens in the midst of change, the democracy of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious God, captivity abounds in us today. Addictions to substances, to certainty, to having our way, addictions to being noticed and liked, addictions to our money, power, sex, addictions to our body image, addictions to toxic relationships. Our change, our chains preach our need for your intervening grace. And so help us this morning to hear the singing, to hear the prayers, and believe those songs and those prayers can be ours too. To know that we are not unnamed to you. Shake our life, if need be, that our chains might fall off. And we might know the freedom of being what we already are. Your beloved child. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is the time of the service where we celebrate uh, the fact that you are so generous that you give on a regular basis to make this community happen. We thank you for that, and we invite you into the joy of giving if that's not part of your practice yet. If this community has been an encouragement to you spiritually, nourished you in some way, been there for you in some way, we invite you to participate in all sorts of ways, and one of those is by giving of your resources. And so thank you for that. And so we pray together each week um, this offering prayer. We make it easy to give. There's a number to text. There it is uh, as well. It was up there already probably. Um, so let's pray together now using the offering prayer. Together. Ascended one, we offer these gifts as a sign of our love, devotion, and praise. Through these, as through our praises, we acknowledge that you are the source of life and the giver of every perfect gift. In your name we pray. Amen. There's a world at war Caught in suffering Silent casualties Oh God grant us in these sleepless nights, I can hardly breathe. Despite brutality, I know that we'll be free. I know that we'll be free. Let the light keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love there's us to see, we'll all be Desperate times, love will hold us here. Love will join our hands, teach us to have no fear. So we lay our head down to wash their feet when we see the other. We'll all be Oh, we'll. Let the light in, keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love gives us to see. We'll all be free. Let the light in, keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love gives us to see. We'll all be
That's what you call a great song selection for that sermon and for this day. Thank you. That was absolutely beautiful, all of you. So we come to this table right now. We remember that the table Jesus sets is for everyone, without exception. This table remembers what Jesus has done, encounters Jesus in the bread and cup, and previews another meal when all things will be right. So Jesus invites you to come. Jesus invites you to be filled um, and to know that you are the beloved child of God and that God is already with you and invites you to awaken to this reality. So let us now confess the faith of the church using the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand? Together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of surprises, your spirit brooded over the waters at creation and lived among your chosen people in wilderness, exile, and promised land. God of comfort and strength, we look to your Holy Spirit to be with us in sorrow and in contentment, in crisis and in abiding stillness. When Christ died on the cross, your power raised him from the tomb on the third day, and that same evening he breathed your forgiving grace on those who had deserted him. On the day of Pentecost, you sent your spirit upon the fearful disciples, filling them with fire, with power, and with wonder and joy, making them your church. And so we gladly thank you with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending praise. We come to you, God, with praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ, your Son. He came as a servant to wash away our pride and feed us with the bread of life. Together, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God of dreams and prophecy, send down upon us your gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and faith of healing, discernment, and interpretation, that your church may be built up in the likeness of your Son. Let anyone who is hungry find in you the bread of life, and anyone who is thirsty find in you rivers of living water. Speak your word to all who are alone or in fear or despair, and let each of your children hear your voice in their own language, whether that language be art or science, work or play. Come among us now through the power of your Holy Spirit that we may be transformed into your image and that these gifts of bread and wine may become for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify your groaning creation that your universe may breathe your breath and be filled with your life anew, that we may love with what you love and do what you do, creator, Christ, and spirit, ever one God. Amen. You may be seated. On the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it, 
and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul tells us as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Would those coming to assist in communion come forward at this time and take your places on top of these mats? Uh, at City Church, we participate in communion by coming forward through the middle aisle and then exiting out the sides. We take the elements with us back to our seats so that we may partake of them as one body. Actually, we're doing intinction, right? So what we're going to do is we'll come forward and we'll have the bread. You'll dip it into the cup. Partake there. Many of us will make the sign of the cross when that takes place. So we invite you into that. If you cannot have wine, it has always been full communion if you just partake of the bread. So feel free to pass on that. We, uh, do we have a station with gluten-free bread? All the way out to the side, we have a station with gluten-free bread. Um, we have communion kits available on each side of the room. And for those of you at home, you could gather together now and take your communion elements at this time. So the gifts of God for the people of God Come and receive them with gladness. Behold what you are and become what you receive. Please join me now in the communion prayer. Eternal God, giver of love and power, your Son, Jesus Christ, has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of peace. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we continue to pray for the needs of the world. 
In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, we bring our prayers to you, gracious God. Holy Spirit of peace, we pray for peace wherever the tragedy of war is rearing its demonic head. We pray for leaders with wisdom to arise. We pray for leaders who intend evil to fall from power and to repent. We continue our prayers for Ukraine, and we pray for the survivors who must go on without loved ones who have been taken in an act of what could only be called murder on a grand scale. We cry out for justice for the people of Ukraine and for all people who are impacted by those who turn to violence to maintain their power and control. Holy Spirit of comfort, we lament today the loss of life of so many over the past few weeks, whether in Buffalo or Rivaldi. Give us leaders of courage to put the safety of their constituents over their love of power. We also lament laws that are being passed in many states that will harm our trans siblings as all trans teens in these states will now be forced to medically detransition. These harmful laws will withdraw youth from gender-affirming care. We pray that your unending love for them and their families will be palpable as they face the days ahead. May they know they are all your beloved children. Holy Spirit of justice, save us from a culture that demonizes what it does not understand. Save us from politicians who would rather score points for the constituents than focus on what it means to do no harm. Give us leaders who will serve every person they represent instead of using fear and division to hold power. Holy Spirit of wisdom, we thank you for the diligent work of our search team for our new senior pastor led so ably by Sarah Dahl. We pray today for Emily McGinley, her husband Rich, and their children, Sella and Micah, as they prepare to move here in August. Give us the grace to hear and receive the story of Jesus, to live lives marked by the fruit of your Holy Spirit as she guides us into all truth, comforts us in our failings, and renews us to take up our cross and follow Jesus as we join God in their mission to renew all things. We pray these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing song?
this good word from God. May the God of peace, who raised to life the great shepherd of the sheep, make you ready to do God's will in every good thing through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We all say together, Amen. Amen. Quick reminder, all members, and frankly, anybody else is welcome to come as well. Next week after church, we're going to have a member meeting. Um, it'll happen right after church, and then right after that, we'll have pizza, parklets out front, and we'll be able to enjoy pizza outside and so on. So that'll happen next week. Um, make sure to be there for that. And uh, let us go forth now to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Go in God's peace.
Thank you. 